Brilliant. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us this afternoon for this panel discussion on difficult conversations um, or conducting difficult conversations. Uh, my name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Uh, new age in the sense that we don't, uh, uh, you know, unlike in a traditional consulting firm, we don't hire consultants and put them on client projects. Instead, we've partnered with a lot of subject matter experts uh, who, uh, you know, work with us on client consulting projects. Uh, this model helped us to grow very quickly uh, from 2017 to the end of 2019. Uh, we already had about 500 consultants. Uh, we delivered about 200 consulting projects across the GCC region, which is our main focus, the, the Gulf region. Um, we decided in 2021, uh, you know, uh, actually we decided in 2020 uh, to try and spend about 20% of our capacity, the excess capacity that was created as a result of, you know, the lockdown and the downturn, et cetera. We decided to spend this excess capacity on, uh, you know, interesting initiatives like helping uh, small businesses and micro businesses get back on track. Uh, passing on expertise and uh, sharing ideas and uh, discuss ideas with uh, larger organizations as well. Uh, we introduced in 2021 this summit called the Connected Insights Web Summit. Uh, so this panel discussion is a part of this Connected Insights Web Summit. It's a seven-day web summit. Today is day seven, so the last day. Uh, we've had uh, about 50 webinars and panel discussions over the last seven days some very, very inter interesting discussions, uh, had more than 1,500 participants from across the GC join in. Um, today's discussion was one I was particularly looking forward to. It's uh, moderated by Jyoti, who uh, uh, you know, I, I believe uh, would be very apt to run a discussion like this. Uh, someone I really look uh, up to and really uh, uh, you know, go to when it comes to uh, uh, you know, having difficult conversations. Uh, so thank you so much, Jyoti, for agreeing to moderate this. Um, just a quick housekeeping point is uh, we've permitted everyone to speak on using the Zoom feature to permit you to speak. So feel free to, uh, you know, ask questions, etc. But please stay on mute while the panelists are speaking. But whenever you have a question, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom or you can uh, unmute yourself and ask a question uh, and we will direct uh, your question to one of the panelists. That's about it from me, uh, Jyoti. Sorry for taking a little longer than I promised, but over to you, looking forward. Uh, thank you, Varun. Uh, thank you for the kind words. And I think you're on to a big, large platform, and I hope it has impact and meaning for the attendees. Um, before I you know, start, I wanted to go round up a panelist. Uh, we've got we've got people from Berlin, from Beirut, you know, from uh, Dubai, and from Delhi. So quite a cross section. Um, so I just wanted to go around, uh, as I can see on the screen, just a quick round of introductions. I'll begin with Harpreet first. Hi, my name is Harpreet. I'm, uh, I'm the Delhi guy in this particular round, uh, but I've had a stint in Dubai. I was there for about 24 years, but I'm uh, vice president of Adizas Institute, which is a management consulting company out of US. So I'm the partner for India and Middle East. And really, Adizas is all about creating an environment of mutual trust and respect in an organization so that the best can happen in that organization. I'm very fortunate to be able to make a difference to many organizations. But alongside that, I'm also a heartfulness practitioner and trainer, which does exactly the same, but at an individual level, how to create an environment of self-trust and self-respect so that the best of me uh, becomes available. So I'm really looking forward to a fun-filled and uh, enjoyable discussion on something which is not easy, which means difficult conversations. I pass back to Jyoti. Uh, thank you, Harpreet. Uh, Aparna? Hey, hi, I'm Aparna, um, based out of Berlin. And um, I work for a company called SumUp, which is a, a FinTech company focused on small businesses globally um, have had a chance to live and work in different parts of the world so before moving to berlin recently i used to be based out of out of dubai my background is in 
the people team or the human resources function across in technology companies, both global <clears throat> and startups, uh, particularly scale ups companies, which are uh, starting to grow really quickly and uh, across the world. Um, it's great to be here with a great panel and I'm very excited to, to talk to everyone. Uh, thank you, Aparna. Amna? Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I'm really excited for today's panel. Um, I'm Amna al uh, the Chief Registrar of the DIFC Courts. Uh, so for you who don't uh, know what is the DIFC, it's the Dubai International Financial Center. Uh, and we operate uh, a common law English speaking courts within the center. Um, and I've been with the courts for more than 14 years. Uh, I'm really passionate about uh, what we do. We're creating a difference for, you know, small businesses, uh, startups, uh, complex uh, uh, businesses uh, and deciding and choosing what is the best forum for them uh, to resolve disputes. Uh, I personally uh, have uh, grown with this organization. Uh, I would say that uh, today, like uh, going through this discussion about having difficult conversations, uh, such a, a good opportunity for me to share my own experience I want, and I will be touching upon my own personal experience uh, with regards to that specific topic. So uh, looking forward to today's uh, chat. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Amna. And finally, Maya. Uh, Maya is in Lebanon, in Beirut, actually in the middle of a food delivery crisis. So she'll come on from while driving to drop food parcels to people. Uh, come, uh, welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maya Taro. Yes, I'm from Beirut. Um, I run an NGO, a nonprofit called Food Bless. We work on uh, hunger relief and food rescue. So basically, today is a typical day in, uh, in Food Bless. Uh, we're going to one of the rural villages to distribute food boxes uh, to refugees. Uh, food Bless uh, works on uh, improving food. Uh, security of uh, vulnerable and underprivileged communities across Lebanon, Lebanese and non-Lebanese alike. When it comes to difficult conversations, uh, I have them all the time because I'm the person who runs the show. Uh, and it's a bit hard when it comes to three different types of people that we have to have difficult conversations with, including our beneficiaries, our donors, and also our volunteers. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we are now ready to, uh, with introductions, a diverse, rich experience, uh, lots of difficult situations that they've dealt with. Uh, just to contextualize it, uh, you know, in my uh, years as an executive coach, uh, I have seen that uh, the ability to conduct difficult conversation is actually a muscle which becomes stronger with practice. And uh, many people have this blind spot and they procrastinate, often to the detriment of their performance and invariably their career. So uh, the ability to uh, recognize the timing, uh, to conduct one uh, and to get what you want while nurturing the relationship rather than rupturing it is an important thing. And um, I've known these people on the panel, eminent people on the panel well. Uh, I'll begin with Amna. Amna has been a client, a mentee, a friend. Uh, so Amna has, has grown at the DRC courts to become CEO and chief registrar. High regard for what she's achieved. Uh, Amna, uh, let me begin with you. Where are you in your journey with respect to conducting difficult conversations today? So um, I believe like after working in this difficult industry uh, as a young uh, female woman, uh, you know, working with the judges and people within this uh, industry, it has been uh, a challenge in the early days, I would say. However, I was able uh, to mature within this uh, field uh, and I was able uh, to really um, show and commit myself uh, to the people around me. And that, to be honest, was one of the major uh, reasons why today I would say I have uh, matured uh, in this um, industry, matured uh, being Amna uh, and dealing with the people from you know, the legal community, people from the business industry. So I would say, of course, uh, as you say, it's a muscle that we need to keep uh, nurturing and you know, practicing, practicing, practicing. And then with that, uh, we are able uh, to win, I would say, difficult conversations. Uh, you need to always be diplomatic. You need to you know, choose your battles, as they say, rather than uh, trying 
to win every conversation as long as you have a really good relationship at the end of that difficult conversation that really counts especially when you are uh, you know working uh, with people uh, saving relationships is really important so for me uh, i started uh, you know like um, i was like this tiny girl uh, i'm actually petite in nature uh, and it was quite tough like going into a room uh, full of uh, men uh, you know with the senior positions uh, it was initially very intimidating uh, and it was a stressful uh, experience however over the years uh, by uh, you know uh, having uh, trust uh, and building the relationship with the different uh, counterparts that really makes a huge difference uh, in having difficult conversations because once they know that you know the person in front of them irrespective of gender uh, is someone that they can count on someone that they can depend on uh, then uh, everything works really well and it becomes a win-win situation because with credibility and trust uh, difficult conversations can always be as smooth as you can expect uh, thank you uh, thank you for that amna uh, harpreet you spent a lot of time in the region uh, in the middle east and one thing i have noticed during my consulting years over the last two decades there is by and large the arabs and especially the more so the emiratis are a polite people who shy away from a difficult conversation and stay superficial right uh, in this environment how do you decide it's time to initiate a difficult conversation oh actually the very reason you said jyoti uh, that they are nice gentle people very welcoming actually makes the ground much riper to have a difficult conversation it actually is the right environment uh, a difficult conversation can become very much more difficult if it's a hostile environment where you know that the people are going to be attacking you with, without even hearing you um, how did i know when it is time uh, when i couldn't take it any more and i knew <laughs> i have to initiate it because it bothered me more than what it should or sometimes it just landed on my lap you know uh, i did ask for it but it kind of came on my lap and i just followed i call it the i call it the three time rule it's it's worked very well for me in my life so whenever i thought something bothered me i waited for one time if it bothered me a second time i let it go on to the third time only when it bothered me beyond the third time is when i said okay now i need to do something with it because many a times silence is a very very powerful mechanism of also having a difficult conversation so you know but that's i do believe backing your instinct is the most important at that point of time uh, so that's what i would say jyoti back to you uh, thank you uh, i'll come to you aparna now uh, aparna you worked in high tech you've broadly worked in the tech sector you worked in you know my uh, start startups with scaled and became unicorns uh, you've worked in uh, india you've worked in dubai you're working in europe you and i've done some work in the us together uh, so how do you and youngsters by and large i assume you work with youngsters who are bright techies and all of that uh, impatient irreverent in that context uh, how do you decide it's time to initiate a difficult conversation i think so uh, there are a couple of things that i've seen like i think harpreet said sometimes you don't get to choose a difficult conversation just lands <laughs> lands on your table or on on you to actually do and um, and sometimes you do have a chance to uh, to actually plan and do it and i think for me the biggest decider if if i have a choice of initiating that difficult conversation it's the biggest decider for me is the is i think about the impact the impact of having the conversation and the impact of not having the conversation right and that kind of is the is is the biggest kind of sniff test so to speak whether to to do go ahead with it because naturally i mean none of us is eager eager to have difficult conversations um, every day right because those uh, difficult conversations have a huge emotional impact on us and we know it will have an impact on the on the other person it's also a difficult conversation because the outcomes are kind of hard to predict otherwise it's an easy conversation if you could predict the 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 outcome stakes are usually high um especially in an organizational context stakes are very high either for that for the person you're having a conversation with or the people you're having the conversation with or for or for yourself um so i think for me the 
the the deciding factor is always the impact if i if we don't have this conversation what does it mean for the individual and for the organization is is there going to be detrimental uh, factors and if we have the conversation what is going to be the impact and and accordingly is when i kind of uh, make a call of whether we should whether i should have it or not but if i don't have a choice and if the discussion lands on my lap then it's basically using years of practice uh, and uh, trying to do the best you can to to deal with deal with the situation uh, thank you amna adil fires has raised his hand uh, i invite you to speak now uh, adil uh, are you there or was that an accident Okay. Uh, raise your hand again, Adil, if, if you are there. Uh, meanwhile, I'll carry on. Uh, I'll move to Maya. Uh, Maya, uh, I have high regard for the kind of work you do, especially in a hostile. You know, uh, we've talked about the role of environment. I mean, you know, in Beirut, bombs going here, war there, uh, poverty all around you, and you are trying to get food to the bottom of the food chain. Uh, so I'm sure you have lots of things. Um, you know, uh, I admire the mission and purpose and the drive you have from what I've known of you. Uh, I invite you to tell us. Uh, you know, uh, are there any tips and tricks you could share for to help people prepare for a difficult conversation? Sure. Um, for me, I would say the rule I always follow. Sorry, if there's a close the window. Um, for me, the number one rule I follow in everything, in, including having difficult conversation, is the golden rule, which is do unto others as you have would have them do unto you. So being empathetic is very important. Uh, putting yourself in the shoes of the person you're trying to have this difficult conversation is also very important. How? So the questions you ask, ask yourself, how would I like to be uh, spoken to? Like in what way um, um, the tone of voice should be really calm. Uh, judgment should be out of the question. Respect is very important. Um, being there for that person, it's not just about giving the conversation and then that's it. You have to be there for the person after the conversation is given. Also, you have to be curious uh, in terms of like listening to that other person. Maybe you have an idea, but they have another one. So it's very important to share your uh, the logic behind your decision and be able also to hear back from the person you're trying to have this conversation with and see their point of view. Uh, maybe you were wrong, maybe you misjudged, um, maybe they deserve another chance. So it's very important, um, more than just to be heard, to hear the other person that's in front of you, uh, I believe. So the tips and, and uh, like uh, quickly is um, listen, uh, don't be judgmental, don't, uh, don't go directly into conclusions without listening to the other person's point of view. And be empathetic. Always put yourself in the other person's shoes and um, ask yourself, how would I like uh, to be spoken to? So that's my tip. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I was asked, what is the topic we are discussing? Somebody is asking to be reminded. The topic is conducting difficult conversations. And Pralhad raised his hand. Uh, Pralhad, you can come in. Maya, I want to come back to you to discuss something after the question. No worries. Yeah, hi, hi, Jyoti. Uh... <laughs> Good to see you as always. Um, for, for the benefit of the people listening in, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Pralad. I founded and have led the uh, Thomas Assessments practice in India and the Sark region now for close to about 20, 23 years. So I've always looked at it from um, a psychometric or a, or a behavioral perspective. So when I saw this uh, concept on difficult conversations. Uh, the only thing that I wanted to leave out there was the fact that it's not a one shoe fits all. Uh, what could be difficult for one kind of uh, a personality profile could be actually quite easy for, for someone else. So the question is, what what kind of style do you bring to the table? What makes it difficult for you? These are something that's a, that's a common thread. That's number one. I think a lot of uh, Difficulty and how you deal with it has to do with your own behavioral style as well as the kind of emotional intelligence construct that you carry with you. Uh, so just a thought, Jyoti, that I wanted to park for this conversation. That's about it. Um, Pralad, that's valuable. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, everybody comes from a different point where they start the journey. The starting point is not the same. Uh, the paths they've traversed are not the same. Uh, 
and uh, you know the people already we talked about the role of environment cultures uh, it, it's it's complex uh, maya i wanted to go back to you to say uh, say that after the conversation you have to be there for the person what does that mean to elaborate or help us with that um yeah sure um so basically um consider yourself you're being for example fired uh, definitely it feels a lot of pressure on you especially if you have a family to feed if you have no other source of income your wife for example doesn't work being there means um at the moment when the difficult conversation happens is just being there just sometimes it doesn't have to do about uh saying anything just your existence in itself holding that person's hand or asking them how they're feeling is really important and makes a huge difference for that person um after that probably maybe help them uh look for better choices for them uh, this role is not for you but i'm pretty sure there are different roles out there that are more suitable for you try not to blame that person or make them feel like it's their like their fault directly because they're in this position maybe it's just um something that they didn't notice and we're helping them notice it we can help them guide them so it's very important um to help a person uh, move on if we can definitely or just guide them um mentor them mentoring is very important uh, in helping someone find their way in life because we don't always know what's the best position for us until we actually find that position and like for example i was um uh, I was studying to become a medical doctor but now I'm saving lives in a di really different way. It's very important when helping someone to ask them not what they want to do uh what what they want to be when they like like I learned very pretty uh early on in my life I not to ask people what they want to be it's ask them what they want to do uh with their lives. For me I always wanted to help others um to be a benefit to my community. and volunteering helped me shape um my future in a way that now I'm in a position that I never knew I would be helping others by providing them food assistance for example so being there for someone is listening to them but also like holding their hand and helping guiding them uh to find a better like position that really suits them that's what i meant by that thank you maya i don't ask people what they want to be ask them what they want to do a very good uh, wise indeed a couple of people have raised their hands i'm not able to see names uh, will you like to unmute yourself and uh, come online maybe tapan can unmute yeah hi jyoti good to see good to see hi, you tapan. as usual and uh, good afternoon to all panelists it's really been very interesting listening to all of you uh and uh, uh i would uh, okay sh a short introduction i am tapan bhattacharya i am uh, heading the international business of hive energy systems uh, we are a lithium ion phosphate battery manufacturer based at uh, us and i look after their international business uh, out of here uh, uh i would like to say something here is uh, that we are fortunate to have a uh, various means of communication these days you know which uh, probably couple of decades back people didn't have those means even the uh, mail has come just uh, i would say a couple of decades back now what i do is i use the combination of means that are available to us say if i'm getting into uh, a difficult conversation i know that i'm getting into a difficult meeting i will not just walk in i will make my grounds i will prepare myself i i will even manage the situation is manage the expectation you know sending a couple of mails prior to the uh, having a difficult conversation which you have already foreseen um, uh, sometimes uh, having a little conversation regarding uh, what kind of a conversation you are going to have during the meeting uh, you know formally uh, i think paves the way in softening the ground and makes your communication much easier Uh, rather than just you appear uh, in in a meeting and and you know and uh, badger on on your on your point so uh, uh, that's what i do you know there are difficult uh, i would share from my personal experience i have had some communication with a uh, with i would say a difficult person 
I mean, uh, difficult from my perspective. He may be a, or she may be a, uh, absolutely fine. Uh, uh, I mean, from others' perspective, probably the kind of discussion we were having is uh, difficult. So um, uh, I, I find, I try and find out what that person is more, um, you know, comfortable with. I have seen some people who are uh, very up and about on on their WhatsApp. Though initially uh, WhatsApp, I didn't uh, take uh, WhatsApp very seriously, but I I have found out that there are some people who are. Uh, who take uh, mails very seriously and officiously, wherein if you pick up the phone and speak to them, uh, it's much easier than when you speak to them, you find, oh my God, this person is so nice. I mean, why did we have to come to this point uh, that it became difficult? So, you know, this is what I, I would uh, share here, that we have to firstly prepare ourselves and use all the means that are available at, at our disposal uh, to have a you know, difficult conversation uh, in a much uh, amicable manner. That's it. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, more than the planning are important. Uh, there were a couple of other raised hands. Uh, could you like to speak before I go back to the panel? I think Devishish, you can uh, speak. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, Jyoti, finally I decided to jump into the bandwagon. So let me throw in my two cents. Um, I think I've met Varun before. Um, about a couple of months back. Let me introduce myself in a brief. Uh, I'm, I'm a man wearing quite a few hats, a surgeon, a hospital administrator, a advisor to a university, a consultant for a medical school being set up, and also a management uh, professional serving on board of quite a few companies. Um, interesting topic. Let me say that uh, we do, at least I personally deal with a lot of instances in my day-to-day -day life, professional life, of handling difficult conversations, which come to me as a matter of fact for, my, for the job that I do. Let me just uh, jot them down in a rapid fashion. First, as a surgeon, when I have to walk out of the theater door and tell a parent or my patient's relative that the, that the patient hasn't made it or the patient is not going to survive. That's a very difficult conversation, telling somebody that the person won't come out successfully after a major surgery. The next is I run the, or rather I am the chairperson for the medical legal litigation cell of the ministry. So almost every day we have a session where we are dealing with litigations involving doctors, paramedical staff and et cetera where we have to interrogate or interview people and question them about their lack of performance or negligence issues. Third comes corporate sector where in the university I have to deal with underperforming staff and tell them, sorry, I need to give you a golden handshake and go home. And obviously in companies also in the presently more so in the pandemic era, firing people or telling them politely, we don't need your services anymore. Now, bottom line is I've been listening to a lot of people and I feel uh, some people did make a point that you need to go prepared because if you know that your job entails that you're going to be handling difficult conversation, whether you know about it or it comes to you suddenly thrown at you like a screwball, you need to be constantly aware of the situations you are potentially going to handle. So you need to have a grip of what are the situations or possible situations you're going to come to face with, number one. Number two, in any difficult conversation, starting point should always be a monologue. I have close to 27 years of experience as a professional. And I have realized, even when you are dealing with any uh, uncomfortable or difficult conversation, the biggest let off or factor where the other person is going to be the recipient of a difficult conversation or the outcome of a difficult conversation is allow him to blow off his steam. And when you allow someone to let off their steam and then finally they come down to plane zero or ground level, then their ability to assimilate, comprehend and kind of rationally accept the bitter pill that you're gonna hand them over, whether you sugarcoat it or you don't, becomes a lot more palatable. So first start off with a monologue where after formal courteous introductions, let the person who must be already having an idea or you give him an idea 
and let him blow hot, blow cold, and blow all his steam off, and then try to start the process of rationalizing. Somebody said, I want to go and hold a hand and be there and try to find an option and help you beyond. I don't think that's a really possible or a very practical and a pragmatic approach. When you are the guy who is firing somebody, then you are doing a job. It's not personal. To go and say that I'm also going to be your psychological counselor and soothe you and, you know, caress you gets a little far-fetched, more philosophy as far as I'm concerned. However, however, bottom line is that, you know, I, I, I am a surgeon and I, and, I, and I believe in one thing. If you have a sore wound and you have a Band-Aid on top, there are two ways of peeling off that Band-Aid. Slowly you peel off and you, ex, you know, feel excruciating pain for a longer period of time. One jiff, it comes out, it hurts a bit, but then even the pain subsides rapidly. You've got to juggle, judge, and balance your situation case by case, person to person, no generic rule, no general you know, paradigm or you know, I would say a logarithm that this is the way it's going to be done, this is the way it should be done, and that's the best way to handle every situation. That's my two cents. Yeah. Thank you, Jyotirmoy, for letting me speak, express myself. Really nice, enjoying the conversation. Uh, thank you, Devashish. I, I know Maya has raised a hand, but Maya, we're running a little late. I'll just come in here possibly to say that, you know, I, I go back to Prahlad and Maya's point. Uh, contexts are different, you know, you're firing a person, you're breaking news of a death, uh, you know, you, you are giving food to the hungry. The contexts are very different and, and my everybody's journey is different. So, I, like you said, I don't think one size fits all. Uh, and I think we've had very, you know, diverse uh, and supplementary points of view. So, I'll respect that. I'll go back to it. And Maya, if we have time, I'll allow you to speak. I'm just running a little conscious of time. So, I'm going to move on. Uh, I'll go to Amna. Amna, would you share any tips and tricks uh, for people who, you know, you come from a legal argumentative litigation background uh, and you've been in that environment uh, quite, would you like to share something there? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Jyoti. Um, I will share experience or tips that can apply to everyone in a way rather than just the legal context because, you know, like legal context is mainly maybe arguing a case in a courtroom or, you know, trying to convince because we are actually neutral as a court, uh, especially in my role. Uh, I don't get into the day to day, let's say, uh, argument, arguing cases, but more overseeing and making sure that parties on both sides have a, a very um, efficient uh, journey, a five star journey from A to that from the time of filing the case. Uh, but I would give my own tips in terms of having difficult conversations, whether with the people you work with, with the specific people from the industry and so forth. So in addition to all what have been said today, uh, everything, of course, uh, is correct. And it depends on the nature, the experience, uh, and the actual conversation and you, who you are having it with. So for me, I would say uh, you need to choose the right uh, time. You need to choose the right place and having those specific uh, difficult conversations. Uh, and third uh, is to make sure uh, that you have very, very deep listening. Allow the person in front of you uh, to express themselves, to, to talk about what their views are. Uh, be, be very conscious, like have active listening. Be very, uh, you know, mindful about their feelings, mindful about, you know, their uh, body language and so forth. Uh, and last but not least, um, of course, like uh, two together, basically, uh, practicing emotional intelligence and bringing your own authenticity to the discussion. Uh, always allow you to emerge into the conversation, uh, to give your own, uh, let's say, a reflection uh, after having heard properly the person in front of you. Again, we, we talk a lot about emotional intelligence and it can be sometimes cliche. However, when I talk about emotional intelligence as knowing uh, the person in front of you, of course, you might end up talking to someone that you never dealt with, uh, so then you need to do proper research about that specific person, especially if you are dealing with that from a business relationship perspective, uh, understanding, you know, their background, uh, biography, uh, how they deal with people and so forth. And then through that, you can uh, decide how to approach that difficult conversation. For people who are you are working with, you need to understand the style of each person, uh, you know, what makes them, you know, get, uh, you know, nervous, uh, how their monkey can erupt in specific discussions. So you need to really 
understand you know the person in front of you and then with each person you'll have a totally different conversation as we said you know uh, you you will be the same person every time but you need to manipulate and adjust the way how you speak to that person depending on their own personalities because there might be people who are very calm there might be people who are hyper there might be people who are you know fast to jumping to conclusion they might be very defensive and so forth so you need to be very careful in handling each person in order to get the best outcome out of that discussion and again as maya said in one of her points you need to know your purpose and you need to highlight your purpose through all your actions on a day-to-day -day basis including difficult conversations because once the person in front of you understand what's your intention they will be actually cooperating and giving you their all and making sure that the outcome is actually what you all uh, expected and what you all uh, dream of having and in that way you have a really successful uh, outcome through having a difficult conversation uh, th thank you amna uh, harpreet i'll come to you uh, you know you talk when you first, first spoke of the role of environment and i know that the kind of work you do is broad, uh, deepening the area of mutual trust and respect can you talk about this and tell what you gained with all your gray hair and beyond about you know how you tell people about building environment or order trust respect or any other things or tips or tricks for to have a difficult conversation harpreet sure um, I Actually, I was thinking of that and the correlation of that, but what I'm struck with is a conversation I had with my daughter. And I think these millennials are so clear in what they think that the gray hair actually has to really listen actively. And I've coined this acronym and it's hot. You need to be hot to have, I think that's where the tip and trick is. And the hot really is the H is for being heartful. And because I come from heartfulness meditation, I think you need to center yourself. You need to be integrated when you go into a difficult conversation. That will allow you to listen better, empathize, all those things that I think we've all been saying. But heartful means sometimes you just take 10 deep breaths before you go, you do a bit of a prayer, you meditate, whatever it takes you to center yourself, become heartful so that you allow your heart to to play the role of being in a difficult conversation. The O of the heart is really, you've got to be open. If you prepare too much and you, you, you may tend to have a prejudgment, you may tend to have a bias and that could be a killer. So you've got to be open. And sometimes the way the conversation is going is maybe not palatable to me, but I still have to be open. So the second or the O is open and the T is really trust. We have to have the trust that the other person also wants it resolved. They also want to somehow overcome that and clean it out for themselves. So I think this HOT is a great acronym, particularly for millennials, and I quite like it. Uh, so I kind of stick to that. Um, the other side is, I think it's been touched upon, but I'll emphasize if you look at the Adiz's framework, mutual trust and respect, which is really the environment. If we are able to have that environment, any difficult conversation is possible with a lot less pain. And therein, the purpose somehow has to be aligned. Values need to be somewhat aligned. Uh, you need to have the right uh, structure for that conversation. You need to know where you can call a shot, where you cannot. You need to have a good information flow on all these are subsets of mutual trust and respect. So, so I would say, to, in simple words, be hot. That's the best way to be prepared. Heartful, open, trusting. Thank you. Uh, and good mnemonic. I hope it helps the panelists and the attendees uh, with that. Aparna, I'll come to you now. Uh, can you share a recent example of a difficult conversation you planned and it did not go quite as per your plan? And what happened? from an organizational context some of the most difficult conversations are always performance conversations and they and at least in my experience very rarely they go as as, as planned however much you 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 plan for it i think um, for me at least it was a situation where i had done a lot of planning a lot of um, context all the, all the good stuff that we have spoken about and we i went into the discussion and the discussion very quickly broke down um, simply because the individual, it, 
happy too. There was a massive emotional reaction from the individual because nowhere uh, or no time before the conversation with me had they got that feedback. And that's always a surprise, right? When And this, especially performance conversations can trigger significant anxiety um, because people's livelihoods, literally livelihoods and self-esteem is at stake. Um, I think, so that was a very, very difficult situation. Also because I think personally for me, when, um, and I think this is true for many of us who work in very multicultural environments, when it's not someone from your culture, which you're more familiar with than others, um, it's particularly difficult to, to kind of really, I think, uh, understand what they're thinking or feeling as well as you understand what you're familiar with. Um, I th so to manage the situation, I think I had to really basically draw on years of experience of staying calm, uh, helping the other person manage their own emotion without kind of have, even if some of the stuff that they, uh, the person said is like completely that I don't agree with, still kind of staying calm, not getting into a rebuttal argument situation, um, helping them calm down, um, leaving a door open for coming back and having another discussion. Because many times, even if the other person is ready, there is it's the expectation that you'll complete a, a difficult conversation in one step, I think is unrealistic, especially in an organizational context. Being ready to kind of make this a multi-step conversation is a particularly important one. And that's what we, what we did finally. We came back, had another conversation and another. So we had three or four conversations by the time we were able to um, get to a, a, a outcome that worked for, uh, worked for all of us. But basically that, that's kind of pretty much every day almost for somebody in my uh, role and function. Uh, I think, especially because what we try to do, at least in our in, in my organization, is we try to practice what's called radical candor. Radical candor is a way of feedback where you're open and direct with the other person with the intention to help. It's not, radi it's not open and direct with the intention of being mean or hurtful or any of those, with the intention to help, support, and develop. But it's it's not for everybody. It takes time to get used to that uh, that kind of style, um, and that's that's a journey. So that's an example of of the most recent one, um, and it's it never. I think while you can have lots of practice, it's never easy. I think even with after many years of practice, it's always still hard. Uh, thank thank you, Aparna. I can see the years of pain and learning from there. Uh, uh, I'll come to Maya now. Uh, I know Bhaskar and some others have raised their hands. Uh, I do want to go through the panel a little more time and we will come back. I've been told by the organizers that we could overrun for people who still want to stay. Uh, but uh, so Maya, would you give us an example of a difficult conversation that did not go as per plan for you and what happened in that case? Um, sure. Uh, just briefly, I want to say for the person who was talking about being there for someone, sometimes it's as much as just being as existing being there it could just be as asking them is there anything i could do for you maybe sometimes the person will know thank you i'm okay maybe they just need um some counsel like that's what i meant we don't have to be their psychologist or anything of what he said not at all just their friend if if we can um i've like for example yesterday i've had um a really bad car accident and a difficult conversation was how to give the news to my parents without making them feel um, stressed or because, you know, parents, they're always like worrying about you. So um, always start with something positive, like I'm OK, an accident happened. It's not like, oh, there has been an accident. People are injured. Just always start with the positive things. Um, uh, another thing um, that happened. So that what went according to plan. Um, to say it didn't go according to plan, it would be a bit hard. I'm, I'm someone who has anxiety and OCD, so I always have plan B, C, D, you name it. Like, I always have this tree. If this didn't happen, I can always do this. If this didn't work, I can do this. So I try not to, and I know plans never go, like, nothing goes according to plan. That's why I have plan A, B, C. I always advise people to have that. 
it really helped it helped me uh, not to be uh, in a difficult situation when it comes like oh my plan didn't work what do I do now so I always have a backup plan but yeah like um, for example once some things like you said you don't even plan to have these chats I think Afana said it uh, one time in the in the kitchen because we have a communication where we cook meals for people in need there was a guy who refused to wear the apron it says he said that it's for girls like I'm a boy I, I can't wear an apron uh, or if I wear an apron just don't take pictures of me and for me I was offended because I was like you're helping us out you believe in our mission uh, this is just you showing your appreciation. It's just making us feel like you're actually um, officially part of the team by wearing our apron. Um, so at, at first he was like um, hesitant about it. But then when I told him, you're free to not wear it. But I believe by signing up to be part of this organization by volunteering, it means you believe in who we are and what we do. And part of what we do is that we don't have gender roles in this organization. Everyone is equal, men or fem like female or males. Uh, we're all equal when it comes in the kitchen. Uh, we're all treated the same and um, no one is treated differently or better than someone else. And he said, you know what, you're right. Um, I'm gonna wear it. And you know what, take a picture of me maybe too. Um, so I was really happy I was able to do this small change, but I know that this small change will, will, will replicate. I'm pretty sure he will share that story with others and others might also be like, yeah, you know, it's not a bad thing. Um, again, having cultural uh, intelligence is very important. Google that world, cult cultural intelligence. Um, it's being intelligent, but in a way that is respective to, to the culture that you're working in, especially for people who work in different countries. Having this is very important. Um, maybe uh, one with a beneficiary, we sometimes have to say no to some people, although we know they are in need. But once you break a rule, it means you have to break it for everyone. So if someone says, I want a food box and he's not or she's not registered, I can't give that person. And it's a lot of emotional burden and I, I feel bad about it. But I have to respect that because if I give him, then I have to give to the other 100. I don't know how many people who will come and ask for it because, oh, you gave him. You're not going to give me. Um, and we can't do that. So. Uh, always be mindful about rules if you're gonna break a rule you have to break it for everyone no exceptions so better stick to the rule or find a backup plan like I always do so I apologize I always am very mindful I say I'm very sorry I know you are in need we're now out of food boxes but look what I'll do I'll take your name and your number and we'll contact you once we have a food box ready for you so that way it's a win-win and everyone's happy and he kept his dignity and felt good about it. Because, you know, in our culture, it's very um, taboo. Like, people are very shamed about saying they're poor. So even for him to ask for it, it's a lot for him. Like, he's actually doing a lot. So I don't want to be that person to, um, like, burst his bubble. So being mindful and empathetic is so important. And always put yourself in other people's shoes. If they're asking for help, maybe you're the... The first or the last person they'll ask for help maybe if you say no they'll just not ask and die from hunger i don't know so just be nice and always be straightforward don't give fake promises a lot of ngos are known for giving fake promises yes we will help you but he never hears from them and it really breaks their hearts and they lose trust in anyone or in even asking for help again so uh, be straightforward if you can help just say you can't if you can say you will if you can't now, say I can't now, but I will definitely uh, give you a call in the future. So that's um, that's how to do it. Uh, uh, very practical, very helpful, very heartful. Uh, Amna, uh, we come to the you know, kind of come to the final leg towards the end of our thing. Uh, Amna, what advice would you give to your 15-year-old self about difficult conversations? So um, um, I would say uh, rather than give, give my 15-year-old self um, advice, I would give an example of how my 11-year-old son handled uh, a very difficult conversation. Uh, and that to me was uh, very inspirational. It, it, he was my role model in that specific discussion. So uh, back in 2020, uh, my 11-year-old uh, was diagnosed uh, with cancer. 
uh, that was the second time he had cancer. So he was aware that he had it when he was younger. Um, you know, he handled that. That was, of course, a life and death uh, conversation where he had to go through it. He was very strong. Uh, he was very open-minded. He listened quite carefully to what he has been, what the doctors were telling him. He, he amazed me, like he, the advice that I got from him basically is listen very well, don't interrupt, be quite opposite, um, positive I mean, and you need to let go. There are conversations that can come through your life, whether personal or through workplace, that you need to relax, let go, and you don't, you can't really expect yourself to control everything that happens around you. So hats off to my son and that specific, conversation. He handled it quite positively. He was very strong-minded that he was going to go through this experience with a positive attitude, with an open heart, knowing that he has a, a, a strong support system around him. He handled it very well. The doctors were impressed with him that he actually made them, you know, gave them the opportunity to talk as much as they wanted. He asked his questions in the end. And he was quiet, strong-minded that I will make it through this um, treatment. And now, alhamdulillah, like one year later, everything is back to normal. Uh, and he has been such an inspiration to me uh, and everyone around us. So I would say always, always just let go, relax, be authentic to yourself and let it be. At the end of the day, if you feel that you were able to hear and reflect how you felt about that specific conversation, that in itself is a one. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for the sharing, uh, wonderful sharing. Uh, a lot of lessons and admission there. Uh, Harpreet, uh, what uh, advice would you give to your 15 year old self about difficult conversations? Boy, you know, I've often, uh, like I said, I'm a, I'm a meditator and this professional. So at times you think it's a tightrope walk, but really it isn't. It's the same. Because if you're uh, as Amna, uh, Hats off to your son, Amna. There's a lot more to learn from children in this. So I'm glad it's my 15-year-old self. So if I have to recreate my 15-year-old self and ask the, the, my 15-year-old self, it'll come down to using my heart. I mean, there are many things, but really the crux is using my heart. And therein, uh, I think I've learned a lot from Heartful Communication, which is, which is a course that I did within the Heartfulness community. And there, what does it mean using the heart? So there are two things in it. You listen from the heart and you listen to the heart. I think they are two distinct things. So when you're listening to someone else, listen from the heart. Words don't matter. Many times we give a lot of significance to words. Words really don't matter. When you listen from the heart, you're looking for the need of that person. What is the person really needing? And what is the feeling that the person is feeling at that time? So the understanding that need and feeling is listening from the heart. And when I pick up the need and feeling, then I listen to my heart. What does it diagnose? What does it tell me? What does it tell me about that person? What does the person really need? So in order to do that, I need to observe, I need to diagnose, I need to understand, I need to listen to my heart to what do I need to now request that person? What do I need to ask of that person? What would be my action point? So listening from the heart is one part of this conversation. Listening to my heart and responding to that is another part of the conversation. To me, if I'm able to do this, I'm authentic. And for me to be able to do this, I need my own clarity within myself. I need to be integrated in myself. I need to leave my fears, my doubts, my ego, my anger on the side. And like Einstein said, if I have to solve something, I have to raise my consciousness. I have to be at a different level than the level of the problem. Because if I'm the level of the problem, I am the problem. So if I have to conduct a conversation, I'll say again, be hot and be authentic and do it from the heart. And, and in the heart, really, it's from and to. And keeping this distinction made it very, much more easy for me uh, than it was earlier. Earlier, it was only gut instinct. 
thank you harpreet uh, you know uh, heartfully rendered uh, thank you for that uh, you know we are, we are approaching the end and you know we could have gone on i just want to go around the panelists quickly you know some closing remarks uh, before i open up to questions in uh, where we'll probably overrun aparna first i think the it was re i really enjoyed the insights especially because you put the panelists together really really well uh, jyoti i think the context because most of us especially in when you're working in large organizations or in companies kind of do kind of come come at difficult conversations from a uh, organizational context i think um both uh, i mean if all the panelists point of view and particularly i think for me uh, maya's context of an ngo is is unfamiliar and i think uh, i think very very uh, insightful i think this is a topic we can talk about for hours together uh, i think there's enough knowledge and uh, wisdom in the room even from a, a audience perspective um, and i think it it would be great uh, maybe at a future date to kind of figure out how to get that uh, uh, into a discussion as well thank you thank you uh, uh, maya you are there I'm not sure if Maya was there. Uh, Amna, could you will you come? Yeah, oh, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um. All right. So, my, my takeaway message. I love what our pre um uh talk from the heart. Yeah, I would say um conversations because the longer you postpone them, the worse it gets. even to have the discussion or the conversation and like one one thing the person would tell you is why didn't you tell me this earlier and someone did mention it in our culture we're very shy of speaking out um about anything sometimes especially if you're a woman or anything like that and the person in front of you is a man um these walls um you like um don't like um uh, see beyond the walls uh see the person as a person not as an employee or a volunteer or whatever um it makes a lot of difference when you see them as another human being um be there for them listen to them um um don't be that toxic person that we all want to avoid um um inspire others even when you're trying to um have a difficult conversation inspire them and um walk the talk uh show them how it's done uh so that they in the future might also be um in a position where they have to deliver a difficult conversation always know that every little act we do uh makes a difference so um be mindful uh and someone is always watching uh thank you maya i think uh, i don't finished uh, we seem to be losing you uh, well, like be always be example you know whatever you do so thank you my uh, amna um of course i believe like uh, today in our discussion we had a lot of uh, common themes uh, as when going through you know your life experience personal or through work we end up you know gaining similar aspects because we're all you know human beings we have feelings we have you know our own views our own cultures our own beliefs so um as we said like you need to speak from your heart hear from your heart uh, go really like give it you know the best that you can uh, as we said like maybe the common theme is mindfulness uh, how you approach each and every person uh, each with their own special you know characteristics you have to really be able to adjust uh these things actually doesn't don't come easily but then with time with maturity with more experiences practicing that you know uh, communication muscle is quite important and with time you will be able to really um give you know all conversation that you have uh, the purpose that you expect from yourself as a person in addition to allowing the person in front of you to really feel good 
because what we want in this world is actually to have you know the peace uh, you know the, the 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 feeling that actually the people in front of us are giving us the opportunity to speak our voice to share our own you know uh, experiences at the end of the day of course especially if you're doing it through your own you know organization there's a work to be done or a job to be uh, to be met however you need to really make sure that the people in front of you understand where you're coming from be very clear in your communication at the same time super authentic because we all need each other and we need to have that ecosystem and the support that each and every one of us uh, needs in order to create a difference and to make a difference so i would say as today like you know it was a really uh, interesting discussion and it was quite uh, you know um, uh, fascinating to see everyone's perspective the different background whether it's like you know emergency rooms from hospitals you know ngo dealing with people in need of food uh, whether it's dealing with startups you know all of the different uh, experiences as as harpreet uh, harpreet said you need to really like you know give it your all and it comes at the end of the day how you are as a human being speaking from your heart at the same time being very mindful about the person in front of you H however we all need to do you know our job we need to create results but it's how you make it happen is the key thank you very much thank you amna uh, harpreet <laughs> jyoti i'm i'm glad uh... I was part of this. I was sweating uh, for the last two days. You know, being with three fabulous women, you stand very little chance normally. You know, so I was praying that you know I would be able to get a little point across. But so I didn't know whether this would be an easy conversation or was this a difficult one. But, but I really, really enjoyed it, and uh, I echo what Anna said. At the end of the day, we are all humans. We come from whichever ethnic ethnicity, from whatever background. It's really a heart and mind. If there is a heart-mind coherence, a difficult conversation can be passed off with a lot more ease and a lot less pain. If the heart-mind coherence is not there, an easy conversation can become difficult in, within, a, within a second. Now, having said that, now I work for a profit organization, which is my consulting arm. And I work for a non-for-profit, which is my meditation practice, which is really no commercials at all for life. A trainer will be with, with your side, helping you to meditate. And really meditation has this rather esoteric uh, connotation. But I would say something like a heartfulness meditation, which I started in Dubai, by the way. I started it in Dubai. And there's a beautiful center in GLT in Dubai. It helps me to become more mindful and heartful in not just difficult conversations in life all around. What it has really taught me is the power of a pause. When to take a pause? When is it? When do you actually become silent? Because silence is very, very, very powerful, very authentic. That pause is very important, and in that pause. Dr. Viktor Frankl, I think he said, at that time, you choose your destiny in that pause. So it's important. And in light of that, I would have be more than happy to recommend a couple of books. One is, of course, uh, 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 both of them are on. Alpreet, may I request you to just type it in the chat box while we do the rest. We are uh, overrun. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. Huh? Sure, just, sure, I, sure. I, I'm I'm sure. I pass it back. I pass it back, Jyoti. Thank you. But please do type it in. Please do type it in. Uh, I know we are overrunning, but but there were questions. I just want to say one thing, which you know may apply broader than uh, what I've heard uh, so far, which was triggered by what Maya said around the importance of rules. Uh, I think rules are very very important. They prevent you. Uh, they allow you to have fun and uh, they allow you to be fair. And uh, for, in childhood, I learned a rule called the hot stove rule. Uh, hot stove is the best, uh, you know, implement best umpire that I know in the world. Uh, what does it? It has four characteristics. A hot stove gives you. If you touch a hot stove, what happens? You get burnt. But there are four characteristics about getting burnt. The first is you get instant feedback. So it's instant. You you don't wait later. The second is that it is proportionate. The longer you touch a hot stove, you get burned that much longer. Third is consistent. You touch it today, you touch it 10 days later, you get burned every time. And the fourth and the most important is it is non-discriminating. It does not matter whether the boss touches it or the subordinate touches it or my dad touches it or I touch it. 
So if you follow these four uh, rules, even in relationships and conversations and, and building a culture or environment, I think we'd be very well off. I don't know, Varun, if we have time. There were questions and there were contributions. Uh, your call, uh, I'll leave it to you to see where you want to go from here. There's still 50 people in the room. Yeah, I think we're okay for another three or four minutes. Uh, if anyone wants to leave, including the panelists, feel free to, of course. But, uh, you know, we're having a very good discussion here. If there's any other questions, we're happy to take them on. What we'd also like to do, if that's okay, is ask everyone to, uh, uh, you know, uh, just give me a second. Yeah, ask everyone to uh, switch on their videos. We'll give it a minute and then we'll make you panelists as well so that you can switch on your videos and we can, uh, we can quickly take a photo. But in the meantime, while we're doing that, if there are any questions, I see that uh, there are a couple of people who raised their hands as well. Feel free to jump in. Any questions, uh, anyone or There's a question that... from Devashish. Do you uh, want to... Question, actually, I just wanted to share a small thing. You know, it's very important to, particularly if you're working in a multi-racial, multinational organization, it's very important if you are the person handling difficult conversations to know the cultural and the ethnic background. Somebody said that does, it doesn't matter. But, you know, I've clocked 22, 23 years in Middle East. I've realized a wonderful culture about the Arab people. Even if there are two Arabs very angry with each other, but when they come first, first face to face, they will have a certain set of greetings. They will greet each other. They will say those greeting words. And then the argument will start or they may even go at each other with their fists. But that is the culture. But then on the other side, you have a lot of, you know, Europeans, particularly the, you know, some, I don't want to name them. I don't want to sound uh, racially biased, who are so hot-blooded, they may just throw something, you know, a, a, an empty coffee cup or something or slam a fist on the table when they're unable to handle the conversation. Or there may be some other people who may just suddenly, you know, just go ballistic. You know, I've seen that. I've handled all those kind of people because I'm dealing with at least about 35, 40 different nationalities in all my work spheres. And I have this wonderful plethora of experience. So it, it really helps. Now, if you're dealing with an Arab guy and he walks in and you've got to give him a bad news, but you start with him, Salaam Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salaam, Kefalakum, and you do the greetings, you know, majority of the iceberg is, you know, thawed out and it becomes very easy to communicate later on. But you try the same thing with somebody, you know, who is, you know, again, I don't want to spell out the nationality, who is already pent up, charged up, loaded like a cannonball. You are, you are putting your head in a tiger's, you know, jaws. So you need to know your audience. That's one. A lot of people have been talking about the heart. But I'll tell you, there are so many times if I have to do deliver unpleasant news, which in my heart is wrenching me, squeezing me. Okay, it's, 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 it's really very painful and sad for me to deliver that news. And if I'm going to soft pedal it, if I'm going to coat it in layers of satin and silk and chocolate, and at the end of the day, that person I know is unable to swallow it and tolerate it, does it still help to just be heartful and not be mindful? That's my question. Because... You know, Harpreet has been talking about meditation. I have been doing meditation. I'm a Swami Vivekananda follower and I do a lot of meditation. And it helps me to keep cool. But it's about considering whether the person across the table is also able to be heartful and not be mindfully delivered. That's my question. So, Harpreet, can you just answer that for me? Hi, Devashish, I'm not here to change your belief systems or anything. I, I was only sharing my own opinion. If what I think whatever works for you is good. If that's what you believe works for you, please go ahead with that. I only wanted to share what, believe, what, what worked for me. To me, a mother, when she pulls the ear of the child or when she gives it a hug at another point of time, both are heartful things, really. Uh, I don't know what is... Because both are, both are for the betterment of the child. But the mother decides in her wisdom 
when it is time to do one or the other. So I think you can only decide what you can want to do, what you will do. It's very, it's almost impossible to predict how the other one will react. You just have to respond to it in that moment. And if you have, if you are more integrated yourself, I think you will be able to come out with the natural response at that time, which could be the best. And at times it could be, it could mean just saying nothing. At other times it could mean even retaliating at that point of time. I don't know what it is. And it's very difficult to predict this because each thing is in a context. But I do believe very honestly that anything that you do for your own integration, for your own self, will ultimately manifest in a better you, in a better, sorry, in a better me being presented to the other person. And I'll be able to better tackle it. That's all I mean. And if whatever works for you in whichever context, good luck. Uh, maybe just continue to keep building on it and find newer ways of making it even better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sounds brilliant. Okay. So if I could ask everyone to please switch on their videos, fix their hair. Let's take a quick photo. I know some of the panelists had to leave and the attendees as well. Uh, but let's, uh, for whoever's still here, let's uh, do a quick one for memory and uh, uh, to difficult conversations and having better uh, having difficult conversations better. Uh, so I'll give everyone about 10 more seconds and then we'll get started. Perfect. So I'm going to say one, two, three difficult conversations. Okay. And that'll make you smile, hopefully. One, two, three difficult conversations. And one more. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, any other final parting words or questions, uh, or should we call it a uh, call it a day? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying on all of you who did. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jyoti. Thank you, Amna and uh, Maya and uh, Aparna. Thank, thank and Harpreet. Thank you so much, everyone. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Goodbye. Bye bye. Masalama. Masalama. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.